Thank you so much. Um, I really appreciate those great comments, and I'm delighted to have been invited here tonight. Thank you for, for including me in your annual meeting. And it's very, I have to mention, it's very fun to see two of my former legislative colleagues here, Kathy Tinglestad and uh, Betsy Worgan, um, who served with me in the legislature. Um, so it's great to be here. It's such a privilege to be working over the last year or two with Greg Ritterbush and with Brian Barant, um, in particular on energy storage topics. And my program at the Energy Transition Lab at the University of Minnesota is all about working in collaboration with people across sectors, um, many external stakeholders, and also many university experts. And we all bring them all together to try to figure out um, our mission, which is to analyze how our energy system is transitioning and how it, that is unfolding, understand how policies and markets and technology are evolving, things like energy storage, and to share knowledge and to try to support and enable progress, especially for our state and region, to try to advance our state's energy system and make Minnesota a real model for a, a resilient, clean energy economy. So I wanted to, um, I just have a very few slides and it's funny because this is one, the one I wanna show you first is one, I didn't just pull this up for this meeting. I use this in almost every talk I ever give and I always use it with my students in particular or when I talk about energy transition more broadly. And so I give a lot of talks and say, what do we mean by energy transition? And so I wanna talk just for a few minutes about that. And I love this slide because it really does tell that story that you were hearing from your CEO. It's only a lifetime ago, one lifetime ago, that we were getting electricity for the first time across rural America. And I love the look of wonder in these children's eyes. In the, this is a schoolhouse um, classroom in North Dakota in 1934, getting their very first electric light bulb. And, um, and I know the, the really important role that, that rural electric co cooperatives played in making that happen and in making sure that all of America was electrified. So to start talking about the energy transition, you have to acknowledge that we have this legacy electricity system and it's really served us well and it's enabled a really great quality of life. But it's going through a massive evolution, a massive change, some would say a revolution, from that system that Thomas Edison started back in the, in the late 1800s. So the, obviously the traditional model we all recognize, large central station power plants, mostly fossil fuel generating systems that send power one way through wires, often long distances to customers. And our new evolving energy system is gonna look a lot different. And we're still going to have big connected grids and big power plants for a very long time. But we're adding to that a lot more renewable energy. It's going to be, and it is, broadly distributed across many owners, many participants, and many geographies. It will be lower carbon, and, and Greg mentioned that it's already um, reducing carbon, it's going to be digitally controlled. And you heard a lot about how that those kinds of technologies are changing the ability to work with your customers. And there's more customer awareness and participation that's coming out of this energy transition. So I swear we didn't coordinate our comments, but they are quite well aligned. So I wanna give you kind of my top 10 factors for what's driving this change. Real quick, I'll go through my list. Um, first of all, we have state policies, and I have to start there because that's kind of where I spent 18 years of my life in, in passing some of our energy laws, like our renewable energy requirements, that um, our renewable energy standard that really helped to build out renewable energy. And we're one of the states that included, like it or not, all the utilities and municipals along with the IOUs in those requirements. And everybody has performed extremely well. And I'm really proud to say we've met that 25% renewable energy requirement in our state just this year, seven years ahead of schedule. That's really impressive. Um, and we've done it with low cost because one of the other big drivers of change is that the costs of renewable energy, as Greg also mentioned, are dropping dramatically first with wind, now with solar, and now um, battery storage is following a very similar trajectory. It still has a ways to go to be as cheap as we would like it to be able to deploy it everywhere that it could be useful, 
But the price, the trajectory looks very similar to what you've seen and the projections for the next few years with renewable energy price uh, um, reductions. So we've had sort of this convergence of cheaper prices, bigger economies of scale, and improving technology. And we've also had a lot of changes to that conventional fleet across the United States. Now, you, I'm sure you know this, that even as federal policies are eliminating um, pushes, regulatory pushes like the clean power plant, coal plants are being retired across the country. More than 250 of them have retired um, since 2010, and it's primarily for economic reasons. And it's just difficult for them to compete in a world with um, high efficiency, increased efficiency, increased renewables, and very low cost natural gas. So we have more distributed energy systems, and we have something called prosumers now. I think that term came from Germany, but it's widely used now everywhere, that you can both be a consumer of electricity and a producer at the same time. Um, and that digital technology means two-way communications and control systems that are going to be, enable customers to participate more fully if they want to in their energy choices and use and to manage their energy use. We also have a global consensus. Even though you might not hear that in the United States political debates, there is a global consensus that we have to cut carbon emissions and that we've also experienced extreme weather events and increased need for resilient power systems. And finally, a strong trend towards electrification. And I saw that when I went to try to plug in my new Volt into your charging station and realized there's a lot of demand for those charging stations already. So thanks for having those. But you need some more fast chargers. Um, so all of these factors together are really, and many others that I didn't even mention, they're driving market disruption. And I like to talk about market disruption as a factor that I love this illustration that just sort of tells the story. And if you've never seen these photos, they're a little distant, but I'll just show you that um, on the left and the right, what you're seeing in both of these photos is Fifth Avenue, New York City, Easter Sunday. And on the left side, it's the year 1900. And on the right side, it's a mere 15 years later. The difference in these photos, on the left, you have to look really, really hard to find the one car. On the right photo, 15 years later, you have to look really, really hard to find the one horse. And that just tells you a story. And that sort of fast-moving disruption and evolution is exactly what I have experienced in all my years of working on energy. And I'll, my example that I like to share is that it was only 15 or 20 years ago at the state capitol where many, many experts said that the highest amount of renewable energy we could ever accommodate into our electricity system was, what do you think, 1% or 3%? Those were, that's what, that's what we thought. And so our utility operators, our grid operators, our utilities have figured out how to manage these really unimaginable levels of renewable energy in a very short period of time and lots of other changes happening. So what this means, what does this big evolution mean? It, it raises some big challenges. One of them is technological innovation. We really have to figure out how to manage a different kind of grid. We need it to be much more flexible to deal with all those variable sources of energy that are being added on. And energy storage is one of those pieces of technologies, advanced energy storage, that we have to figure out how to use it in a way that serves our system as well as possible. And that's what a, a great deal of our work has been about in the last couple of years, trying to figure that out and share that learning. And Conexus's project is a fantastic example of, of using storage combined with renewable energy to cut peak demand and save customers money. Another piece of this big sort of disruption and change is that it creates a lot of opportunity. So I just want to point out that Minnesota has been a real leader in developing jobs in this clean energy ecosystem, which is very broadly covers a lot of different parts of that equation of energy. Everything from energy efficiency to renewables to um, storage. And we have a heck of a lot of jobs that have been created. And that sector of the economy is growing faster than most other sectors of the economy, even through the recession years. 
and the wages are higher. So tell, you already know that, you all work for a utility or some of, no, you don't all work for a utility, you're all part of a utility, you're members. Some of you work for the utility, but you all have kids, a lot of you, or kids in college, or nieces and nephews, or others, tell them. I tell my students that you are, that are working on energy, and, and we, we work with students like those different sectors we work with that are in technology or in policy and law or in um, economics because they're all part of figuring out our new energy system and how it's going to be optimized and develop most um, in the very best way possible. And I tell them, you are going to shape the future. It's, it's happening right now and you have this really exciting opportunity. So. That's what I think about Conexus too. So I'm, I'm just delighted to be here because it's been so fun to work with Conexus and to um, watch the evolution of this solar plus storage project. And I have to tell you, you guys are pretty humble about it, but this is a nation leading project. It's one of its, of its kind, it's first in its class. You guys are going to be national models. You're gonna have people coming from all over the country to look at this project that an electric co-op has done and how it's being used, pollinator, habitat, and all, to um, reduce peak demand, to save money for customers, reduce carbon. It is going to be the largest storage project in, the, in Minnesota and very unique and one of the biggest in the region. Um, and um, so really what I would encourage you to do is to not stop. Don't stop innovating. Keep doing what you're doing and, and do more because you're establishing yourselves, like it or not, you're in a leadership position in this evolving energy evolution that we're living through, this energy transition. And you've demonstrated a really important role that electric co-ops can, can provide and serve in this in this changing system because you can be more nimble than some of those big investor owned utilities that have to go through those extra, you know, long uh, regulatory processes. Um, you're closer to customers and to your local communities and you are showing that you can do good and do well. One of my favorite, favorite slogans by benefiting members and benefiting society. So I'm really proud of Conexus and really proud to be um, working with you on this project and really delighted that we're gonna have a continuing partnership. So one of the things we like to do at the University of Minnesota is figure out how to kind of open those doors to university expertise and partner with the community. And we are going to be putting together research teams and collaborators that are going to work on many of the issues that Conexus has raised and sort of experienced during this process and as you go forward with this innovative new project, we're gonna do a lot of work on trying to analyze that and see how we can all learn from this experience and share that learning more broadly across the university and to stakeholders around the state. And we're delighted that um, Greg Ritterbush will also be participating in our Germany Energy Policy Exchange. That's a long standing partnership that um, has enabled a lot of Minnesotans and a lot of Germans to learn from each other about the future energy system and how we can sort of get best practices from each other. So this is exciting and I can't wait for the celebration of that new project. I definitely wanna be there and bring on the solar honey. Can't wait to try it. Thank you so much.